Okay, hopefully everybody can see this. So yes, today we look at what we learn from, from audiences uh, in the algorithmic VOD recommender system research. And in many ways, what I'm trying to do in this, in this short presentation is to create a bit of an arc. And it's an arc that's very personal to me in terms of my, my research, but also trying to mark where has research in this been and where is it now? And it's actually very exciting now. And that's why actually these seminars have been very beneficial to me because actually things have moved on quite a lot since I started in this, in this realm. So what I'm going to do today is give a very brief overview of the state of the research of when I was joining this club, so, so to speak. So looking at the early stage research and commentary on algorithmic VOT recommender systems, I'm gonna give a little bit of extract from my own empirical audience study as a kind of uh, example of how one could use audiences as a way to understand this technology and these systems and these, these platforms. Um, but doing it from a user-centric perspective rather than one that is from a technology perspective. Um, and then finally, I'm going to just very briefly make a conclusion, um, just commenting a little bit on um, a few recent research that is kind of bringing things forward and just to categorize that a little bit about how actually um, we can move beyond some of the approaches that were present certainly in 2018. So to this first brief part, the, what, what were the assumptions of this early stage research? <clears throat> Well, when I kind of joined this, uh, this, this uh, area of, of activity, it seemed to me that there were kind of two sides of, of the debate. And when I say this debate, of course, in scholarly articles, but also wide, wider popular culture, uh, that were latching on to this idea of recommender systems and, and algorithms being a feature uh, of film culture. And of course, my own background is really as a film scholar, film and media scholar. That's where I'm coming coming to this this uh, this topic. So there were a number of topics within this. Um, one, of course, that will be familiar to most of you is this idea of personalization, the idea that um, uh, one can uh, narrow cast rather than broadcast content. Uh, that is, it is therefore on demand. This is part of the ontology, of course, of, of VOD uh, and the uh, the intervention of, of, of algorithms. The scalability, of course, of that, right? The idea, and this is this is prophesied in these texts, like uh, this is not just one barber who is telling you this is the right haircut for you. This is not just your doctor saying this is the right medicine for you. This is one that you can scale. And this is the, the benefits of the algorithmic recommender system. There were a number of buzzwords at this time that were put out in these scholarly and then also semi-scholarly works. So for example, collective wisdom or collective intelligence um, or the wisdom of crowds uh, to, to quote the uh, eponymous uh, book. The idea that actually passive taste signals are more important than active taste signals. In other words, what I say about my taste is less interesting than what I show about my taste by my, my selections on a certain portal, what I click over, what I hover over, for example. And of course, from the companies themselves that are developing and monetizing um, these uh, algorithms into systems, this was on the one hand, one part of their, a major part of their unique selling proposition and their marketing, especially for net Netflix, uh, but al also for some of the other competitors, um, certainly for Amazon, uh, at least in its consumer, wider consumer function. And we have some, you know, some claims that were made by internal Netflix engineers, et cetera, that at that time, the, um, the recommender system had a $1 billion value. I'm sure it's much, much greater now based on the difference between offering just on a basis of popularity um, uh, alone. And there were also lots of, you know, almost fantastic tales. And these were reported and recycled in the news media. I remember very clearly a news report from Jon Snow and Channel 4 in Britain about how House of Cards was this new thing that was created by algorithms. Now, of course, when we go to the, the, the production backstory, actually, of how House of Cards was created and etc., it's a lot more complicated than, and actually a lot more typical than uh, what is suggested. But certainly these, these tales are important as discourses. So we have this on one side. And then we had on the other side at this time, now think back, this is to 2018, um, a set in 2019, et cetera, a set of, of articles, a set of scholarly works 
that are then sort of criticizing the um, the algorithmic what became known as the algorithm culture algorithmic culture, and there were a number of basics or topics for this criticism. Um, one was almost an extension of a wider surveillance critique, uh, very leaning on like Foucault, Deleuze, for example. Others were taking issue with the, the way of um, a kind of uh, quantification of taste or a mathematization of taste that was maybe um, making unpure the pronouncements of critics or uh, this kind of idea that um, uh, a data is uh, being substituted for identity, for example. And then two other ones that are, I think, are really powerful narratives that we also need to put under pressure. Um, and I want to put them under pressure here and also um, in my wider, my wider and more recent work is uh, on the one hand, the so-called filter bubble argument that was, of course, popularized in the book by Eli Parisa. Um, and of course, the basis for that book, it's a very powerful narrative um, uh, when, when you read it, um, that basically because of the technology um, that is used in algorithmic recommender systems, because of the idea of personalization that is being heralded, of course, by the creators of these systems, that there is a tendency for them to confirm biases, that if it is giving you what you want, then it will give you too much of what you want and it will put you into a kind of a taste silo. And then this, so the argument goes, creates a certain amount of social uh, polarization. Um, it creates a confirmation bias um, and a lack of understanding. And ultimately, so the argument goes, a kind of almost fragmentation of liberal de democracy. And this, of course, you know, in a more kind of narrow sense, have lots of things, implications in terms of taste. For example, the classic idea of taste of um, this, you know, what you should be consuming or what we should be educated on is like from Matthew Arnold, the best of what has been thought and said. Now it's just, well, this is what works for you. Um, so that was one powerful argument that, that was in the, in the room. And the other powerful argument that we should just mention is the black box argument. Um, this argument that, I mean, if we kind of reduce this argument, it's essentially that we, which we cannot see, we cannot know, and that which we cannot know is unknowably dangerous. There, there's a kind of element of danger um, in, in this, this idea of the black box argument, and an idea in which it actually shuts down inquiry. And actually, that, that's that's a, a big part of my, always been a part of my problem with that argument, is that fair enough, yes, we can see into some of the mechanics of the algorithm, a little bit says proprietary data, but the idea that suddenly now as scholars we're hopeless uh, to research these phenomena, that's where I have a, a, a serious problem with it, that argument. And indeed, that's what I kind of, that was the kind of the basis and stepping point for my, my own work. Because what is very interesting about both of these sides, both the kind of cheerleaders and then the ones um, who are making some really trenchant critiques of the system, is a common assumption. The assumption behind both of these arguments in their pure form, certainly, is that these um, algorithms or algorithmic recommender systems are widely, if not exclusively used, that they are incredibly effective um, and that they're unprecedented and new that there is no, there's no precedent or, or genealogy uh, to, to these, these, these media forms. And underlying this, of course, is a very strong techno-determinism, is the idea that if this technology exists, if there is a certain uh, affordance to this technology that we can determine through analysis, for example, the idea that um, if an algorithm is trying to personalize, then it will lead to an over-personalization. Um, the idea came, uh, came, came, to, came to be that, that for a certain technology, there must be a certain effect. And of course, this is the definition of, of techno determinism. There was a lack of kind of understanding of the precedents for, for these things. And so, so this is, that was the basis, that was the reason essentially why I wrote my book um, in, in 2021, Netflix recommends. And I, I used a number of different methods um, to approach this. To get to get by the black box problem, to to and then try to to question the filter bubble argument and, and so on. 
And, and the one that I want to focus on in this, um, you know, in this presentation, of course, the title of this presentation is that bit around audiences. How do actually looking at audiences can maybe fill the vacuum that we uh, maybe are experiencing or fearing of, 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 of the black box? So what I want to do for the, you know, the rest of the time um, is essentially to think about, um, to give you an excerpt of that, to give you a little bit of snippets of what I learned on my journey of, of, of asking audiences and asking audiences to demonstrate how they use uh, uh, algorithmic uh, VOD recommender systems. Um, and then I can come to some, some conclusions. So essentially what I, I was trying to, to figure out is actually, you know, how are users conceiving of their experience? Do they trust these things? Do they know about these things? Uh, are they thinking about these things? And of course, how do they weigh using VOD recommender systems across the other ways that they come to, to choose films, whether it's word of mouth, adverts, and, and so on. And so just to give you a little bit of sense of the, the study design, um, and this is basically, you know, a, a bulky chapter, about I think 50, 50 or 60 pages in, in the book. It's a, it's a chunky, chunky chapter. Um, first of all, I, I conducted um, two national representative uh, surveys with the uh, kind of polling company, uh, YouGov, one in the UK and um, uh, one in the United States to get a little bit of sense of, you know, is there something going on that's specific nationally or not? Then we did um, uh, 34 in-depth semi-structured interviews and also VOD use demos. So we basically said to them, okay, log on to Netflix, log on to your favorite VOD and, and let's see, you know, how, how are you gonna, gonna, gonna choose? We did that in the UK. And then obviously there's lots of other studies internationally that have, have been done uh, in various ways, asking different questions, of course, um, and, and try to triangulate with, with those. And the idea, of course, here, and this, of course, is true with, with all audience research, but I, I explicitly made, made this, uh, I made this explicit with an appeal to what uh, Toff and Nielsen called folk theories. So underlying this idea of folk theory, um, that these are ways that, that regular people come to understand and conceive of their media experience. Now, the idea of a folk theory is that this could be completely wrong, factually wrong, right? You could have a folk theory that, um, you know, um, I don't know, that uh, uh, Google is not has an algorithm or something like that, or that uh, which we sometimes found was that actually some people believe that um, certain rows on Netflix were not led by algorithm, that if it said like popular, that was just completely, you know, free from, from algorithm or something like that. But essentially, the, the point to make here in this context is to say that um, we in the audience research, we're not like making fun of the, the of audience members saying the wrong thing. We want to understand how they conceive of their reality. We want, to, we want to meet them on their social reality. So I'm just going to give you a few snippets. I'm not going to go into depth, especially on the, the quantitative stuff. It's all it's you know much of this is in or all of this in in, in the book. Um, um, now. What of course we found um, even, and these studies were, were conducted in November, December, um, you know, 2018. Um, obviously by this time, a really high um, concentration and um, high, high widespread use of, of EOT. Um, but we found at that point, at least, only a very small fraction were at least willing to tell us that they were likely to use um, a, a recommender system in choosing, choosing their films. Um, indeed, and only 10% rank them as, as the, the top three, and a very low trust, essentially, in algorithms, at least in that very direct form. So, you know, just to, just to, just to illustrate this very, very briefly, um, you know, this was the question that we asked only of the people that were, were had used or do use video on, on demand, and that was a little bit smaller, it was about 1700 people of our sample um, in, in the UK sample. Um, and, and here you see, you know, graphically, um, and it's not very close, right? Um, it's a kind of, you know, stratified, you know, word of mouth, very, very high up there. Um, and then things like genre search, trailers, perhaps, critics review, a little bit more. Um, a lot of these kind of like almost featured popularity freshness. And it's only really that you get down to, this is obviously the same question. 
you get, you get down to kind of, you know, here, 13% on-screen personalized recommendations. Um, or here, a, a proxy question that we asked, so that it's a little bit less direct. Prominence on my video-on-demand platform home screen, 70 13%. At least those were willing to like, admit. Okay, this is a, a really important thing for me. Now, there's a lot of differentiation in this, and I'll get to that in a second, when you, you know, stratify in terms of age, when you, you stratify in terms of different characteristics. But let's just go then a little bit into the, some of the qualitative results, because I think these are, these are even, well, these are a bit more interesting. What we found um, was a number of things, a number of complicating factors, a lot of gray areas. Um, you know, first of all, our participants were using very different information regimes and way of finding about films and choosing films based on the viewing situation and based on the media. So, for example, you know, as a rule for cinema, they were using a lot more, uh, you know, tools because they felt like the opportunity cost was a little bit higher. The opportunity cost of, of you know, uh, inviting a friend and going out, etc. So we found that. We found some differentiation in terms of that. We found some of this like one-stop shop phenomenon. So people were actually really um, moved by the fact that actually um, it's great on Netflix because you can see the trailer, you can you know read a little bit of description and do all these things all on the platform. You don't have to go you know Google a, 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 a review or something like that. We found in general a very much an individualized multi-stage process to the selection. Um, so, for example, even though the quantitative was saying, well, you know, 24% are using adverts, uh, you know, and 29% and in the US, um, we need to nuance that. So, for example, we had one participant who told us, well, actually, if I'm going to see a Star Wars, I, I don't want, I don't need to see anything more than a, a teaser advert. All I need to know is the date that this film is going to appear on whatever medium uh, or, or, or platform I'm going to, going to see. This is the most important thing. Or for example, we had one participant who was telling us, because we, we always ask these participants, tell us about the last film you watched and tell us how you, you came to choose it. Um, and so this, this participant, um, number nine, um, she told us, well, she had first seen this uh, advert on a bus, then later she saw another advert on television, then she Googled about the film, then she went to watch the trailer. She had already seen the previous uh, film in this franchise, so she didn't go to the parents' blog, which she usually does, because she always watches films with her son. And then she knew that it was gonna be okay, so she suggests this to her son and, and goes to see it. Individualized multi-stage process. And, you know, abstracting from this is basically a different function of these information sources. The information sources on the portal, information sources external to the portal. So, for example, usually these participants would go through an awareness process, a trigger to find out that this film actually exists. Then often they would go through a stage two, a research or vetting process. You know, is this, who is this guy? Who is this actor? Or, you know, what is this film about? Trying to locate it in terms of, of, of genre. And often these people told us they had a very set order. They had a set of routines that they would continually do when they would, would go through this. And then often when this film uh, was striking to them, when it was disappointing to them or whether it was great or whether, you know, whatever it was, they would have a third stage, which is basically uh, during watching the film or after watching the film to test their opinion, to find out the answers, if it's a true story, to find out more about that, to look into the production history and so on and so forth. Individualized multi-stage trials process. So that's a one little tidbit that we saw. I, I want to give you one more tidbit uh, of, of, of what we kind of found out in this, this audience research. And this about the kind of level of credibility and trust that our participants had um, within this, um, you know, in these uh, algorithmic recommender systems. So again, if we, the, the, the level of trust was very low. Um, if we ask uh, participants directly in the quantitative, for example, um, or directly in, in the qualitative, usually. But there were certain subsets that were actually quite keen on them. And we want to really kind of understand, you know, these different types of, of audiences. So we had select demographics, usually the younger ones were much more keen, certain demographic groups, et cetera. 
And so, for example, in the qualitative, we had four of ours of, of, that, that were really just gung ho about this about this to us. And there were different reasons. And a lot of these reasons were essentially recycling media narratives and marketing narratives. So for example, we had the, our youngest participant who was 15 years old says, uh, yes, I like using these because these recommender systems encourage new shows. You get to choose more widely what you watch and there's just so much choice out there. So these are very important to me. Um, and indeed, what he said was, uh, in, in opposition to what we might think of, of maybe our reaction or, or to some other audience's reaction, he says, no, I don't trust critics because anybody could do that. Um, I trust what the recommender system tells me. Interesting view. What was very interesting, though, was when we did this demo. So we do it, a demo with uh, uh, this uh, participant number two. And, we, and for her, like with everybody, we said, okay, put on your VOD. Uh, and uh, show us, show us what, you know, if you're just kind of scrolling around and, and you know, want to pick something, what we can going to pick. So she said, uh, well, I would pick this film. And it was a film called um, uh, Queen of Katja. And essentially through this, this kind of narrative between um, the, this participant and my research assistant, um, it became quite clear um, that basically one, she had some she had some trust in this uh, recommender system and it's in its expression through this 96% and through the match score. This was important to her. Again, this is a, a person who has a high level of trust, already said a high level of trust in recommender system. So, and this was a, a quite interesting thing. The, the research assistant asked her, um, well, what would you do if that film, Queen of Katwe, had only 60%? 65%, would you still want, want to watch that? And here you see, actually, she says, oh, well, actually, no, I would, I, would still, I would still watch it. And what you see her doing and rationalizing in this last little bit at the bottom of the screen is essentially she's triangulating other information sources. In this case, it's very clear the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the thumbnail, you know, the, the, the marketing materials, um, are really affecting her choice. She thinks that based on the visuals, this is something, this is going to be a genre that interests me. This is going to be a film that interests me. So in this case, um, we need to think about this. Not only this is a recommender system that is determining, you know, is brainwashing this person, but actually this is someone, even though she has a very high level of trust in the system, is triangulating different sources. So yes, we need to always keep these things with a, a look at these things with a, a grain of salt. And obviously, there were a lot of participants in our study that were very skeptical. They were equally skeptical. They would say things like, "I don't trust an algorithm. I were never going to watch something an algorithm uh, tells me what, what to do. I do the opposite. Uh, it's not authentic, and, and so on." But in many ways, these were these polls were the exceptions that proved the rule. What we in general, what we in general found. And I won't go into these things in, in great depth. Um, but what we in general found was a kind of underlying ambivalence about these tools. And these scripts or folk theories that participants would use to justify why they, even though they had concerns, uh, would balance them with, with uh, a kind of, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the first instance, a consumer's con uh, convenience. So a kind of a, a, I don't know if I would call it a cognitive uh, uh, a dissonance. But certainly um, a kind of a uh, Janus face um, uh, approach, ambivalent approach. On the one hand, a theoretical mistrust at the same time, it's like, well, it's very convenient because, um, well, I'm just wanting to watch a film tonight for, for relaxation. Another folk theory was about this idea that recommender systems misjudge moods and they can't understand the interest in human taste. In other words, a limit about the effectiveness and trust in recommender systems. It's fine if I'm in the right mood, but it cannot know if I'm in the right mood for a documentary or for rom-com. So it's not, you know, 100% uh, good. It, I, I might catch a good day or I might ca ca catch a bad day. And implicit in this is very interesting because there was lots of participants who would say, well, I'm very weird. I like documentaries and I like rom-coms or I like action films and I like art films. But the thing is actually, everybody says that. If we look actually at larger studies of taste, this is actually not a peculiar thing. This is actually a more normal thing, but people believe that everybody else 
that they are unique, that they have these different tastes, but everybody else is just watching rom-coms or just watching documentaries, etc. So that is a very interesting one. Okay, and then there was another narrative of folk theory about you know surveillance, filter bubbles, and, and so. And, and here again, there are a lot of recycling of the narratives that are coming down through the news media, that are coming down through academic discourse as well. Um, and they were essentially um, kind of replicating these narratives to understand the media choices. And so they would often say things, you know, it, it would come down to this idea of fate or free will. So some people would say things like, you just can't, you know, you just can't get, uh, can't escape algorithms these days. So yeah, just have to go along with that. Or they would say things like, oh, if you want to escape an algorithm, you just go to the different genre. Uh, again, there's some, obviously some misconceptions uh, about, you know, the, the role of algorithms there, but it's important as a narrative. Okay, um, how am I doing for time, Paolo? Just fine. So you take the time. <laughs> no. Okay. 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 Yeah. I, I, I might not go into this slide in depth. I'm coming to my conclusion, by the way. Uh, I might not go into this depth. Maybe we can bring this up in the, in the Q&A. But they had some very interesting things to say about critics and, and algorithms. And we can come, come, come back to it. But again, then the, the, the overarching thing is it's complicated. It's not a one, it, you know, here I was testing out, and as as Paolo and, and, and Katarina were saying, you know, I'm coming through this through my prior research into the role of film critics in the digital age. Um, and it's the the narrative of okay, algorithms replacing film critics one to one, that didn't hold up. It's a lot more complicated than that. And we again we can get to that in the in the QA perhaps. But I want to come to some conclusions and I want to get a little just touch on very, very briefly some of the really new promising research. Some of it um, has been featured in the seminar series, and I've been very appreciative of that. Uh, but just to some conclusions that I, I was reaching um, um, in, in my research about audiences and the use of audiences to understand these technological phenomena. Um, on the one hand, everybody's doing it, right? <laughs> you know, SVOD is very widespread, so we know that actually a very high percentage of the population in the UK, throughout Europe, and so on, is functionally using algorithms um, in this sense to, to, to access uh, audiovisual material. At the same time, if you ask participants directly, recommender systems and algorithms have a very low credibility among the general population. And we again, we know this from the, the nationally um, you know, uh, representative surveys that I did, and we know this from other surveys that have been done in Europe and, and so on. Bachelor's and Shifting, for example. So there's all the other things that we know about the ways in which people come to, to, to access films, which belie the idea of this idea that maybe a kind of maybe filter, that this kind of maybe a pure filter, filter bubble narrative that because these, these technologies exist, uh, because people are using them, therefore people are going into the, the filter bubble. A lot more complicated than that. And we only know that by looking at this through audience perspective, rather than looking at this through the perspective of the portals, or looking at the perspective of our technology. And of course, one other, other thing that is a kind of a side note from all this is that word of mouth in the age, the so-called age of atomization, in the so-called age of algorithm and, and so on, um, and we don't want to, you know, uh, undermine that that uh, fact at all. What well, old-fashioned word of mouth, what a friend tells you that they're watching, um, is is but still by far the most important factor. Um, and we saw this. It was a very interesting. I, I just saw this one anecdote. It was a participant of ours, um, and he was from Scotland, and he was a very low um, low use media user. So he would watch, you know, just a few. Uh, you know, films, you know, per month or something like that on, on, on VOD. And he would say, look, films and series have a very low, um, you know, role in my life. I'm not a cinephile, but my friend, uh, but I like to go, I like to hang out with my friends and I go to the pub twice a week with my friends and they like to watch things. And our conversations are usually around, what did you watch? So he would be, would be watching, you know, on, on, on Netflix and things like this to be able to have conversations with his friends in the pub. Films were, were ha having in his, his role a, a very strong role in his social life, but not as a kind of aesthetic form or not really even as entertainment to a certain degree, but to Greece as a social lubricant. 
And I think we need to always keep this in, in our, our perspective when we, when we, we treat this, this subject. Okay, um, we saw, we've seen the, the number of themes, etc. And I, really interesting things. I mean, you know, I could go much more in depth in these in the, in the Q&A, but um, the differences between heavy and light users, between low stakes users, high stakes uh, users. And I talked about this idea of keeping up. So the idea the Scottish uh, chap, um, the sociality was, 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 was very, very key to him. So I think, you know, one, one thing just to kind of, you know, leave us on before I go to the final slide about, um, you know, the, the research going forward. You know, the algorithmic recommender systems are undeniably extremely complex uh, and kind of almost miraculous in the sense of the work that has been done into them to create what, what, what they are. And as one Netflix uh, uh, engineer said, you need a PhD in, in statistics or a PhD in mathematics to truly under, understand that, no doubt. The input is extremely complex and extremely, um, you know, kind of have deep respect for that. But in many ways, the output of recommender systems, at least in these days, um, are less complex. The idea that 97% or 65%, um, those numbers alone, or the, the other outputs uh, um, uh, of, of, of recommender system on a platform from user perspective is a lot less complex and it's clear that audiences are um, kind of you know registering that okay so just to, to, to wrap things up um thank you for attention um uh, in this in this uh, or how my research is going forward since the, the book the book came out is um in an essay that i'm, I'm currently writing um about the ways in which we could go forward with, with, with research into this, this topic. And ways that transcend or triangulate or get around, you know, the filter bubble argument and certainly above all the black box problem. Because I, as I said at the beginning of this, I find the black box uh, issue as a scholar, very demoralizing. Uh, and it's a kind of a, a um, again, as I say, it, it, unfortunately, it becomes a way to shut down a conversation rather than open a conversation. And I want to, in my research and everything I do as a scholar, to open conversations rather than shut them down. So I, I just, in this, in this new essay, what I suggest is three potential ways forward, ways forward that different people are, are using. Um, certainly, I think longitudinal data collection um, like has been recently done very successfully by, by Amanda Lotz, for example, and collaborators uh, working with Ampere analysis to actually see what people are actually watching. So to go beyond just counting, you know, what is actually available somewhere in a back catalog on a, on a VOD, because of course, as we know, the presentation of the content will vary from user to user, but actually be able to detect what, what people are doing. And in, in, in essence, a lot of this is done through audience research, but let's just call this longitudinal data collection, because we can find a lots of things about media use. And for example, about diversity of content, about uh, exposure diversity um, of different uh, films and different nationalities and so on through the several research. So this is one maybe avenue going forward. The other are the kind of experimental studies. And, you know, I was really, um, uh, I got a real kick out of um, the um, the presentation that uh, Niko uh, Pajkovic gave uh, on this seminar series uh, and the experiments that, that he was doing. You know, very, very interesting stuff and very productive uh, kind of avenue of research going forward. And then finally, you know, um, going further than I have done with um, the uh, empirical audience studies to, to actually ask audiences, to test audiences, to do demonstration with them, uh, and different ways of approximating method methodologically um, how these tools are or are not uh, affecting them. And I mean, I think some of the really large scale uh, types of audience studies that have been done by Hanchard, not in the VOD space, could be, you know, if we kind of can triangulate what, what Amanda Lotz and her colleagues are doing within the kind of and the large scale things that Hanchard is doing, that could be very interesting going forward. But thank you for your attention and um, uh, really delighted to be here and to hear any, any questions that you have.